must have seemed like a dream. Who were these conquerors from New York that had dealt Goliath such a blow? Were they dreamers? Not really, just a football team. This is their story. It's my honor to open today's welcoming ceremonies for our conquering team. And it is a privilege on behalf of the greatest city in the world to pay tribute to the greatest football team in the world, the New York Jets. If their 1968 season was to end in a dream, the Jets had to face reality in their very first game against one of the league's best teams, the Kansas City Chiefs. The Jets would beat the Chiefs in a close game, a game that was virtually a mirror image of their entire season. Joe Namath and his superb core of receivers would provide many of the points. When Namath could not throw touchdowns, Jim Turner's field goals would often be the winning margin, as they were today. The defense would prevent even the best offense from scoring touchdowns. The Chiefs scored none. And finally, the ability of the offense to control the ball late in the game, as they did for six minutes against the Chiefs, would secure many victories. Victories that eventually would lead New York to the summit of pro football. Three weeks later, the Jets opened their home season against San Diego before the largest crowd in AFL history. Again, they faced one of the league's strongest teams on a night that often resembled a graceful yet violent ballet. The Jets trailed by four with five minutes to play. Joe Namath took over for one last drive. Though he would fail to throw a touchdown in this and the next five games, his passes to valuable swingman Mark Smolinski set up the running of Emerson Boozer, who finally scored with one minute left. But it was left to Johnny Sample and the defense to preserve victory. The Jets had again beaten off a strong challenge with defense and ball control, the stuff of which champions are made. If there had been a surprise thus far, it was the ability of the Jets' offensive line, known mainly for its pass blocking, to help establish a strong ground game, a ground attack that was both deep and versatile. Veteran Bill Mathis scored five times in a spot roll. Villanova's Billy Joe, number 35, is perhaps the strongest reserve fullback in football. In 1967, number 32, Emerson Boozer, was injured for half the season, but still led the league in touchdowns. This year, Boozer scored less, but developed his blocking and receiving to become a complete runner, although with great speed and good power. He is still a threat to score. Matt 
Snell carried the brunt of the Jets' running attack, and like Boozer, he is a most versatile setback. Known almost as well for his role as a blocker, Snell fully recovered from a knee injury that sidelined him last year and led the team in rushing with over 700 yards. Snell's recovery and the ability of the offense to rely on more than one man's arm were instrumental in the Jets' greatest season. A wise old man once said that offense draws crowds, defense wins championships. After five years of building, Coach Wee Bubank finally achieved such a defense, the number one defense in the league. Kill him! Come on. It was an alert and aggressive defense, known more for its results than for its brawn. Unlike most teams, the Jets had a front five. Carl McAdams, number 50, often helped out at tackle. McAdams helped veteran Paul Rochester, number 72. And second year man, John Elliott, number 80, known affectionately as Big Bad John. From the outside came number 86, Berlin Biggs, at 270 pounds, remarkably agile, and an expert hand fighter. And at left end stood Jerry Philbin, number 81, the first of three Jets to make the AFL-NFL All-Pro team. Philbin's quick reactions and great pursuit finally brought him the recognition he had long deserved as a lineman's lineman. With this kind of pressure from the front line, linebackers Ralph Baker, Larry Grantham, and Al Atkinson were able to play deeper than usual, important strategy in molding a great defense. This made the surprise element of the blitz even more effective, and the Jet linebackers were adept at its execution. The Jets' last line of defense, its secondary, was perhaps the only one in pro football to contain four free agents. Defensive captain Johnny Sample sometimes had to control his teammates' emotions, but most of the time, Sample vented his own. Always a fierce competitor, Sample would this year realize a dream when he would take revenge on the league that had dropped him four years ago. Randy Beverly, number 42, is one of the Jets' bright new stars. The strong and speedy sophomore cornerback would later make a lasting impression on the Baltimore Colts. Number 48, Cornell Gordon, alternated with these two. In his sixth year, Bill Baird, number 46, was a steady performer at free safety. And sure tackling Jim Hudson, number 22, rounded out a defense that led the league against the run, was second against the pass, and helped transform the Jets from a good team into a great one. But the Jets had lost two of five games thus far, and the Astrodome became the setting for a crucial contest with Houston. Last year, the Oilers won the Eastern title by one game over New York with a strong defense. Today, it was the Jets' defense, led by John Elliott, that was to shine under the artificial sky of the Astrodome. Shut out for three quarters. Houston rallied, however, and took a one-point lead with four minutes to play. Namath once again had to engineer a time-consuming drive downfield. With 50 
seconds left, Matt Snell finally scored. And the Jets had achieved another last-minute victory that propelled them into a division lead they would never relinquish. Against Boston, the Jets enjoyed their first real breather of the season. The defense caused eight turnovers and set up half the touchdowns in a 48-14 rout of the Patriots. Against Buffalo, however, it was not the collective legs of the defense that would give New York its sixth victory, but rather the strong right leg of Jim Turner, who kicked six field goals today and went on to kick 34 for a pro football record. Turner's adept right leg earned him the league scoring title with more points than any pure kicker has ever recorded. The Jets next faced a rematch with the Houston Oilers in a downpour at Shea Stadium. It was really no contest. Number 51, Ralph Baker led a defense that by now had established itself as a formidable obstacle, one that Joe Namath said eased his burden tremendously. But Namath continued to guide the Jets well. His strategic passing, four Turner field goals, and the running of Bill Mathis produced a 26-7 victory. Last year, the Oilers eliminated New York on the final day. Today, in only the ninth week, New York had all but eliminated them. But it was fitting that two weeks later in San Diego, a city with a history of champions, the Jets would clinch their first title ever. Their 37-15 victory over the Chargers was a culmination of all New York had worked for. They had held the most explosive attack in the league to 200 total yards, while they themselves had racked up over 500. Namath was again throwing touchdowns, and this 87-yard scoring pass to Don Maynard was the longest in Jet history. Four days later, the Oilers lost to Kansas City, and the New York Jets became Eastern Division champions. A team of talent and a team of depth. Veterans Babe Perilli and Bake Turner led the Jets through their last three games, and they finished with 11 victories, a club record. 11 victories, 11 victories on the legs of Jim Turner, on the blocking of linemen like Winston Hill, who led their powerful runners into the end zone for more touchdowns than any other team. On a conservative yet tenacious defense that never stopped hitting, never let down. And 11 victories on a trio of Texans, perhaps the best set of receivers in football. Tight end Pete Lamons, possibly the Jets' best blocker, is a tough man to tackle with the ball. Don Maynard's sideburns are not quite as long as his legs, and not nearly as long as his impressive record. In 1968, Maynard passed Raymond Berry in yards gained to become the most prolific receiver in history. In his brilliant 11-year career, Maynard has caught over 500 passes good for over five miles and has set many team and league records. With great moves and the long stride of a thoroughbred, country Don Maynard will continue to charm and excite New Yorkers until he retires. Split in George Sauer is not as shifty nor as fast as Don Maynard. All he has are the best hands in pro football. <laughs> 
Sauer finished second in receiving, but was still named to the combined all-pro team. So the Jets were a total team. Defense, runners, receivers, and there was someone else. With his hair grew Joe Namath's reputation as football's most colorful and most gifted passer. But if his epitaph were to be written today, it would say that in 1968, Joe Namath ceased to be just a great passer and became a great quarterback. Namath has long played with two fragile knees, a tribute to his undying courage, while also a tribute to his protection, the best any quarterback could hope for. And one that allowed him to do his thing. And in 1968, Broadway Joe did his thing. To Namath, numbers didn't matter, only results. And when the Jets won all but one of the games in which he failed to throw a touchdown, Namath's ability to win, to lead New York long and far, became irreputable. While others doubted, Joe believed and fulfilled his team's greatest ambition. For millions of his fanatic followers, only Joe Namath could do it. And Joe Namath did. Joe Namath and his teammates entered the AFL championship as underdogs to the Oakland Raiders. But the Jets were a proud team, and they remembered an earlier game in Oakland that came to be known as the Heidi Bowl. In that game, Namath had passed and run his team to an early lead. Darrell LaMonica had also been sharp, and the lead changed often until the Jets led by three with one minute left. Then TV gave way to a little girl. Only Raider fans would be able to enjoy the unbelievable finish that ended in a victory for Oakland. That was six weeks ago and 3,000 miles away. Today in New York, Heidi would not interfere. It was a windy day and both coaches wondered if their explosive offenses would be able to score at all. They were almost right. Only two touchdowns were scored by halftime. Let's get on the board. Watch it throw. Second to him. Nothing, nothing, come on. The Jets took a 13 to 10 lead into the third quarter. All right, off defense, just keep your poise now. The defense kept its poise. Jump! Oh, no! They stopped Oakland on a goal line stand that resulted in only a field goal and saved four points. Then late in the third quarter, Coach Eubank called for some strategy. How about a cue, run the guy into that soft stuff and then go to the side? Come on, Joe, we can do it again! Dig it out, baby! The strategy worked to perfection. He's in there! Touchdown! Touchdown! Get him, Big Green! But Oakland took the lead in the final quarter. Namath had six minutes to regain it. With two passes to Maynard, he did. Come on, baby, our game, our game, let's go! We did it! Come on, let's get the first down! time, time enough for Oakland to move the ball to the Jets 12. Then came the play of the year for New York, a play worthy of repeating. A pass thrown behind an imaginary line. Out of thousands, one play and an AFL championship. 
Congratulations, Oh, you son of a gun. What a great guy. I'll tell you. We're going to get it. That's right. Absolutely. It's quick. Four years. You know, you think it's... Took a long time coming, four years. You want to win every year, first year on. Nothing else matters to me, winning, whether I catch one or ten. Nothing else matters. For Don Maynard and the Jets, there was one more game to win, a game that would not soon be forgotten. The third annual Super Bowl was supposed to be a farce. The so-called experts had given the Jets two chances of winning, little and none. But they had forgotten something. They forgot to tell Coach Weeb Eubank. They forgot to tell a cool and confident Joe Namath. And they forgot to tell the New York Jets. The experts said Jim Turner's toe would fail him in the big game, but nobody told Turner, whose three field goals were the margin of difference. The experts said the mighty Colt defense that some thought was football's best in a decade would chew up the Jets' ground game, but nobody told Matt Snell, who with outstanding blocking racked up 130 yards and scored the game's first touchdown. The experts said Joe Namath would be lucky to escape alive from the Colts' front line, and his receivers too nervous to catch his passes, but nobody told Namath, whose quick release and accurate throws to George Sauer completely fooled the blitzing Colts. And finally, the experts said Earl Morrill and the Colts' passing attack would burn the Jets' weak secondary into the Orange Bowl ground, but nobody told Sample, Hudson, Baird, and Beverly who with great pressure from the front line were able to make four key interceptions that were in fact the difference between defeat and a 16 to seven victory. Neither the razzle dazzle of Earl Morrill nor the appearance of John Unitas could change the result. When time had graciously run out on the once invincible, now bitterly disappointed NFL champions, experts said they had witnessed the greatest upset in sports history. But we Bank felt differently. He had said it would be a simple matter of poise and execution. The Jets had kept their poise and executed flawlessly. Now their season long goal was no longer just a dream. Later, the feelings of an entire team were expressed by a man who came to the Jets only last summer, guard Bob Talamini. I will say this to everybody. Uh, we're humble winners. I think the NFL should be humble winners also. I'd like to think that this will bring all the football closer together because if this does anything, this will solidify the thinking of the public that football is football, the American League, and the NFL can be mentioned in the same breath. Forty men, a coach, and a goal. For seven months, they had labored. And now the fruits of their labor had brought them to the top. The New York Jets were pro football's world champions.
In the words of Buffalo head coach Lou Saban, a football team is like a wheel. Players need to tie themselves around certain players. They need a hub, and then they become the spokes that make the wheel go round. In Buffalo, the hub is number 32, O.J. Simpson. On opening day of the 1973 season in New England, the spokes sent the hub flying free, and the bills were rolling. Early in the game, Simpson escaped on an 80-yard touchdown run, signaling the birth of what became the most prolific rushing attack in the history of the National Football League. Simpson was not the only beneficiary of the Bills' brutal blocking. Teammate Larry Watkins blasted for 105 yards and two touchdowns. In Buffalo's 31-13 romp, center Bruce Jarvis, guards Reggie McKenzie and Joe DeLamalure, tackles Donnie Green and Dave Foley, and tight end Paul Seymour paved the way for 360 yards rushing and a record-setting day for O.J. Consistently finding cracks in the Patriot defense, Simpson edged closer to the single-game rushing record. When it was over, Simpson totaled 250 yards, an NFL record. The hub and the spokes were one. Suddenly aware of the heights they could reach, the Bills would win four of their first five games, their best start since 1965. In San Diego, the Bills learned a valuable lesson. Simpson rushed for over 100 yards, but Buffalo was bushwhacked 34 to seven. Clearly, one man could not do it alone. In their new stadium at Orchard Park, the Bills regained their earlier momentum. The defense that stretched in San Diego snapped back against the Jets. Led by number 73, Earl Edwards, Buffalo surrendered just seven points. The performance by the defense was the difference versus the Jets. O.J. was again over the 100-yard mark, but the Bills could not cross the goal line. And three Johnny Leipold field goals provided the edge in a 9-7 Buffalo victory. Rookie quarterback Joe Ferguson was still learning, but he was learning well. Facing the Colts, whom the Bills had touched for just one touchdown in their previous four games, Ferguson led Buffalo to 31 points. Simpson topped 100 yards rushing for the seventh straight game. But more important, the Bills battered an old antagonist, 31-13. The Bills' great getaway was typified by a spectacular win over the Eagles. Rookie Wallace Francis returned to kick off 101 yards as Buffalo barged to a 17-6 lead. Francis enjoyed every moment of his first professional touchdown. It brought cheers from over 72,000 fans. But it was the performance of another man that left them standing in the aisle.
Like the Bills, the Eagles are a team of character. And by the fourth quarter, Philadelphia had forged a lead of its own. trailing by two, Ferguson kept his wits about him, hitched up his britches, straightened his helmet, and drove the Bills to within field goal range. John Leipold's 47-yarder was good, and the Bills led 27-26. Then, dramatically, with three seconds left, Eagle Tom Dempsey had a chip shot to win. With a gaudy four and one record, Buffalo was off to Miami for a first place showdown with the Dolphins. The Buffalo Miami confrontation never really developed. For the first time all season, Simpson was held under 100 yards and the Bills' momentum crumbled in a sea of slips and slip-ups. The Bills were suddenly jolted into reverse, traveling a bumpy road pockmarked with four losses in the next five games. Against the Saints, Simpson was held to 79 yards, and the Bills lost a game they had hoped to win. In the Bengal game, the Bills again flashed signs of their early season promise. Jim Braxton returned from injury to join the backfield, and Simpson's touchdown brought the Bills into a 13-13 tie with the playoff-bound Bengals. The tie held up until three seconds remained. But this time, the enemy kicker put it through, and the Bills lost a heartbreaker. The next week brought a rematch with the Dolphins. Against the eventual Super Bowl champions, a team that had not allowed a 100-yard rushing performance in 45 games, both Simpson and Braxton went over the century mark. offense cranked up over 340 yards against Miami. With Ferguson finding J.D. Hill in the seams of the Dolphins zone, the Buffalo attack moved easily. But each time the Bills threatened, the Dolphins rose up to stop them. Though they played superbly, the Bills again lost. The remarkable achievements of one individual meant little for a team that was floundering. And let's hear it for the Bills! Let's hear it! Come on! Let's go! Let's go, Bills! The Bills' only win of the tough five-game streak came three weeks earlier in their Monday night national television debut.
In the defensive line, Mike Kadish, Jeff Winans, Jerry Patton, Walt Patelski, and Earl Edwards close down the Kansas City attack. The game was decided early when middle linebacker Jim Chayunsky first recovered a fumble and then intercepted a pass, both deep in Kansas City territory. O.J. turned the turnovers into touchdowns, and the Bills' early lead held up for a 23-14 victory. But what the Buffalo faithful had come for was to see O.J. go for 1,000. On 39 bone-wearying carries, another NFL record, Simpson rushed for 159 yards, and Bills fans saw the juice near the magic mark. In only the seventh week of the NFL season, O.J. Simpson had reached 1,000 yards, and dreams of a 2,000-yard season were crystallizing in Buffalo. Simpson credits much of his success to the Bills' excellent young offensive line. Tackle Dave Foley, a four-year veteran, was plucked from the waiver wire to join Donnie Green, a three-year pro at the tackle position. Rookie Joe Delamalure, one of the Bills' two number one draft picks, joined second-year man and all-pro Reggie McKenzie at guard. Bruce Jarvis began the year as the Bills' center. When he was injured, Mike Montler picked up where Jarvis left off. Finally, there was Paul Seymour, a tackle in college, who was converted to a 252-pound tight end. Simpson paid his line the ultimate compliment when he said, I hope to stay in the league until these guys get so old, no young back can get behind them to break my record. But it wasn't only the offensive line that made records possible. Saban knew that to take full advantage of the redoubtable Simpson, he needed a defense that would not permit the Bills to fall behind and into passing situations. A defense that would not allow the opposition to keep the ball. A defense that hit. In 1973, the Bills allowed 147 fewer points than in 1972. During the last month of the season, the Bills' defense played a critical role as Buffalo drove toward a possible playoff spot. With wins in their last four games, the Bills had a shot at the playoffs. To reach the postseason, it was the performance of the team that counted. And against the Colts, the Bills were a total team, a blend of clutch offense and gritty defense. When the Bills' line wasn't dumping Marty Domrez, the linebackers, led by rookie John Scorpan, were making life miserable for his backs. Simpson rang up another 100-yard game to bring his total to 1,447 yards for the season. But late in the game, the Bills trailed 17-10. It was time to measure the true medal of the team. Spurred by Joe Ferguson's best day as a pro, the Bills clawed back. With less than two minutes remaining, Ferguson's pass to Bob Chandler tied the score. Fittingly, the defense came up with the play that won it when Dwight Harrison intercepted and took it back all the way. The drive toward the playoffs continued in Atlanta, where the Buffalo defense cooled the league's hottest team.
the Falcons managed but six points. While on offense, the Juice rushed for 137 yards and led the Bills to a 17-6 victory. With 1,584 yards, O.J. was within reach of the improbable, Jim Brown's league rushing record, and the incredible, a 2,000-yard season. In the snow against the Patriots, Buffalo was looking for its eighth win of the year and first winning season since 1966. Again, there was a total team effort. The kickoff team freed Francis, the AFC kickoff return champion in 1973, for his second touchdown, and the Bills were on their way to a 37-13 victory. The rapid development of rookie quarterback Joe Ferguson was evident as he hit Bob Chandler with two touchdown strikes. Then there was the Juice, who ignored the elements and rushed for 219 yards. With their eighth win safely in hand, the Bills headed for New York. Their goals clearly defined. Shea Stadium, December 16, 1973. A day of questions for the Buffalo Bills. Could they rise from the ashes of four victories in 1972 to make the playoffs in 1973? Could O.J. Simpson crack the legendary Jim Brown's single season rushing mark? Could he reach the plateau no NFL runner had ever dreamed of? 2,000 yards in one season. The answers would astound the pro football world. The Buffalo defense played an important part in accomplishing the gaudy goals the Bills had set for themselves. As Simpson waited to make his run for the record, in the Buffalo secondary, Dwight Harrison, Robert James, Ernie Kellerman and Tony Green put the wraps on Joe Namath's receivers. They made sure Joe Willie did not keep the ball from the Bills' offense and frustrate O.J.'s rendezvous with the record book. The Bills wrapped up their ninth win of the season when rookie Bill Cahill returned a punt 51 yards to put the game out of reach. The Bills finished the 1973 season with nine wins and five defeats. They narrowly missed the playoffs, but they did not miss their appointment with professional football destiny. Conceived on a blazing autumn afternoon in New England, the odyssey ended on a snow-filled Sunday in Shea Stadium, a moment of ultimate triumph for Buffalo and its irresistible force, O.J. Simpson. With all eyes in Shea Stadium locked on number 32, O.J. set his sights on Jimmy Brown's single-season rushing record of 1,863 yards. Early in the first quarter, Simpson reached the threshold. This is how Al Meltzer, Ed Rutkowski, and I describe for the radio audience a moment that will live forever as a part of pro football history. Well, gentlemen, we are coming upon it, and uh, the Juice should break the National Football League rushing record in this next series. Simpson running left. Simpson breaking loose. And there it is. He's in. All right. All right. He needed four yards. He got five. And this crowd, his whole team is gathering around him and congratulating him. Hit him on the head. There isn't a person sitting down. Give credit to these Jets fans. They, they came here to see him break the record. There's no doubt about it. 
I think the Jets showed up to see him break the record. Joe Namath said to me on Wednesday, sure, I want to see him break the record. He deserves it. He's that kind of a guy. I'm not rooting against my defensive ball players. He says, but he's got to get it. And he did. But there were more records in store. On this same Sunday in New York, the Bills became the first team in history to rush for over 3,000 yards in a season. Finally, there remained but one more goal. And in its realization, the Buffalo Bills would reach out and touch a star. And now it's for the 2,000, boys. For the 2,000. That's uh, Reggie McKenzie's ambition. I never thought I'd, I'd to get ever to thought I'd see it. Honest. Oh, oh, I never thought I'd see it. They'll give him the ball all afternoon. Give him the game, the ball, the tail, the ears, and the hooks. O.J. running left. O.J. 5-4. Maybe more. I maybe don't know. six. Maybe there six. He did it. They did it. Yeah. They're oh. lifting him up on his shoulders now. I just wonder if the three of us at this moment fully realize what it has been our great privilege to see and broadcast and account for every inch of what has happened this season. I think I don't think it'll hit me for quite a while yet, but it's been a thrill for me, let me tell you, to watch O.J. Simpson run for 2,000 yards in one season.